Um, and I, yeah, for sure, regarding the church and how they were, and how people who uh, who maybe were Christian are now atheists, how they were treated, it, it tracks like with me completely. Yeah. Personally, for the way I'm wired, I I just am not wired. I mean, and it could be because of how I was brought up, but like the yeah. God thing is very, is, it, for me, it's a very helpful belief of making sense of certain aspects of life in the universe. So mm-hmm. I hold to it, uh, but I, I understand why atheists would not, you know, or why they yeah. would even argue like how problematic religion can be at times. I mean, I think it's a very fair point. 100% of the proceeds gained from this monetized episode will be donated to sciencesaves.org. Thanks for listening. Tim, thank you so much for joining me today. I'm super stoked to talk to you. I was recommended your podcast either by Apple. It was either by Apple or by Spotify. Um, And yeah, and so at first when I heard new evangelicals, you know, obviously I thought one thing, I thought it was going to be just like an evangelical podcast, you know, of the standard fair, but I was very quickly surprised about the entire brand um, just being quite the opposite of that. I read a couple of interviews that you had done and it it was so interesting that you were the complete opposite of what I expected. And I like to think of myself as a very open-minded person. Um, and I still didn't realize that I had like a certain image in my head until you negated that image, I guess. And so I just knew I had to talk to you and I knew I had to introduce you to the audience and, and let us get to know you a little bit. So feel free to tell us about yourself. Well, that's really kind. And I'm actually going to use what you just said uh, for my audience to tell them to please keep rating and liking it because it actually gets recommended to people's feeds. So that's really cool to hear. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I I totally recognize that the name New Evangelicals for for many people is, is triggering, frankly. Like, oh, my God, evangelical. Like, I have a really negative, you know, perspective. And frankly, as uh, someone who grew up in those spaces, I also have a very negative perspective, which is why I, I, I started this account. But yeah, I mean, very quick snapshot about me is I grew up uh, homeschooled. I grew up in very reformed type circles. So uh, that means like John MacArthur, uh, you know, John Piper were kind of like the big pastors and people that I um, grew up on, like theologically speaking. I grew up Calvinist, uh, which wow. essentially means that, you know, God has predestined a few people, luckily I'm one of them, of course, to go to heaven and the rest to burn forever. Um, and you know, I, I grew up in that world, uh, very, for what it was, loving world. My parents are great humans. Uh, we still are, are, we are close. They're, they're amazing grandparents. So, you know, um, I grew up in a, in a very, for what it was, a very healthy and loving environment given the circumstances, right? I tell people that, that people like my parents were doing the best they could with the information that they had at the time. So yeah. it is what it is. I'm always committed to Jesus, always committed to Jesus. I, I have all the awards of being a good Christian in evangelical spaces. I did the church thing. I, I, I've done the church planting thing the whole nine. And, and long story short, we can unpack this as we go along. But at 2016, the election with Trump was a watershed moment for me of like, okay, I think something's really wrong here. But I was still pre- pretty firmly seated in those spaces. I was a drummer. I was playing often. I loved it as a musician. Um, and then between the Black Lives Matter movement and then the response from the church and then COVID um, and the response, again, from the evangelical church in those spaces, I said, you know, something is really wrong. I think we need a, a new evangelical movement. Um, and I started an Instagram account. Um two years ago, December of 2020. Yeah, December, December of 2020. Uh, just kind of asking the question, like any other Christians out here concerned have have questions, comments. And right. I realized that 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 this term deconstructing uh, existed and this tr- movement of ex evangelicals existed. And I kind of found myself in the throes of that. And we grew pretty quickly online. And I realized, that, okay, there's something here. So we became a nonprofit uh, last year. And I've been doing this work full time for a little over a year now um, between podcasting and social media and all that kind of shit. Yeah, that's that's so cool. And one thing that I liked about everything that I was reading about the start of the the I w- I don't want to say the brand because that sounds, uh, yeah. but I'll say I'll say the brand, I but I don't yeah. I don't mean it like the brand. But I, one I of the things I, I liked as the umbrella 
of uh, the new evangelicals was um, a lot of my followers had been asking, like, why don't you talk to people more about the political aspect of why they deconstructed or the political aspect of why they make certain religious um, choices that they do? And I liked that a lot of what you mentioned was very political and not in a way that was polarizing in any way. It was just you you really can't say that you have a strong opinion with a faith and say that you don't have a strong opinion when applying morals to politics or morals to social aspects. Yeah. And I think a lot of people try to do one or the other. They try to say like, oh, I'm a very strong Christian, but I don't follow politics. And at a certain point, I feel like they do intersect and you do have to kind of make a decision on certain very big social topics in order to kind of move forward. And I felt like you did, but you did in a way that was very um, educational. Like at no point in anything about you, did I read where you were like, yeah, and that's the way it is. And if you don't think that way, then you're archaic and you're gross. It was more like, I felt this way about these situations that were happening. And I felt like the way that your current church was responding to those situations wasn't quite what you felt should align with the other messages that they were sending. And so you decided to kind of, I guess, launch your own version of what you thought it meant to be an evangelical. Is that, am I saying that right? Kind of. I mean, yes, yes and no, I think, because I didn't really know what I was doing at the time. I mean, I, right. I didn't have the categories that I have now of like right. Christian nationalism. Um, and, and, and when I started this account, I was still at my evangelical church. My mm -hmm. hope was... My, my hope honestly was that just like how I make room for them and they're my people and I volunteer and I've been there for six years, they can make room for me in this journey. Right. And in four months, they kind of gave me the ultimatum of like, hey, you, right. you stop serving or you stop doing this work. And by that time, there were so many people reaching out to us who were so hurt by the evangelical church for good reason. I knew that I couldn't abandon that work. It was too right. important. So I had right. to kind of step down, you know, but, but the motive in the beginning wasn't like to be like, oh, you're not doing it right. I'm going to do it the right way. Because honestly, right. that's a very evangelical approach is like right. what they do is they church plant, right? So, oh, we don't like how this church is doing it. So I'll just start my own church. And that's not ultimately healthy. But at the, at the time, my, my, my heart, so to speak, you know, like what I was desiring was, was, can we think about these things differently? You know, I'm not claiming to be a church or, or claiming right. to do it better, but can we just examine like some of this stuff and, and really ask like, what is going on with this Trump worship by people who taught me as a young kid that, that a particular sexual ethic of monogamy is paramount and right. they're mad at me because I won't vote for the guy on the cover of Playboy on his third right. marriage. Like something is right. wrong with that picture. So that was kind of the, the, the questions I was asking. And then as I got into the work, it became very apparent. And as I had to learn very quickly, how deep, like the rot of that, I call it the evangelical basement. I always use a house analogy, but it just became very clear, very quick that like the basement is really moldy and stinky and it's problematic and we right? have to do something. So it kind of morphed over time. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I completely agree with that. I, I, I think there is a big difference between, like you said, church planting and presenting ideas, hoping to kind of start a conversation and maybe make some changes to kind of like forward the way that people think and forward the way that they um, worship and the way that they present themselves as opposed to, no, I don't like you guys. I'm starting my own church. Like that's the end. And something I thought that people would really like about your background as well is that something I run into a lot running this podcast is people think I either have to be Christian and, and have these social beliefs, or I have to be atheist and have these social beliefs. And you're saying, no, no, I'm still very much a Christian. I still very much believe in God, right? I still very much follow the worship of Jesus Christ. But I also think there is room in that worship for these, what are considered more liberal beliefs. And I would, I would you, don't, argue, you don't have to leave. Yeah. I mean, I, I personally argue that like, because of my faith and my allegiance to right. Jesus, I have these beliefs. Like it, right. it seems like a pretty logical conclusion that if Jesus in Luke says 
he's coming to bring liberation for the oppressed as right. a Christian, you want to participate in whatever that means. Right. And right. I understand in our cultural moment, it kind of puts you in like this more liberal space, but that's just a term we use to hopefully kind of capture something that is bigger than that. Right. So you right. Know, personally, I'm sure like most of your listeners, I'm assuming none of us have a Joe Biden flag planted on our front yard. Like we don't give a right. shit, you know, no. at the same time, like, Yes, black lives absolutely matter. And, and as an atheist, you can get there. And I would argue as a Christian, we should also, I mean, we should be there a thousand percent. It makes complete right. sense. But this particular um, flavor, this particular expression of Christianity in America is so steeped in nationalism and supremacy without even knowing it, that it stands opposed to things that to me are like, have you read the scriptures? Yeah. I mean, really, have you read them? These are not far-fetched ideas. Right. Right. And that's that's another wild thing is that I feel like a lot of modern Christians, a lot of my friends who call themselves like modern Christians and like kind of new wave Christians have read more of the Bible than the people who I feel like led them through their youth in the church. They actually can quote scripture and they can they can use more biblical passages to support their more modern um, ideology, I guess in a similar way that it sounds like you're describing. And, and I think that's interesting because I think a lot of people would say, have you even read the Bible? You have these liberal beliefs and other people can say, actually I have, which is why I have these quote unquote liberal beliefs. Yeah, I think it's important to recognize that the Bible can be used as a tool for liberation or a weapon for oppression. I mean, right. in our own history in America, we can look at, at, at white evangelicals who insisted that, that the Bible was clear, that segregation was mandated by God, and that anyone who wanted to integrate the races was stand, standing opposed to God, right? And, right. and they, had, they had, I would argue, weird, but they had their arguments from, from quote unquote, the Bible. Right. And, I, and, and what we want to be careful of, and by we, I mean me and like the work that we do, is that what we don't want to pretend is like somehow we have a new supremacy. Oh, we're reading the Bible completely the right way, and these people are not. Frankly, it comes down to interpretive differences because people can pull Bible verses to make the Bible say anything they want. I would argue that 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 in general, this is broad, the themes of scripture are bent towards liberation, are bent towards looking out and being part of the work of liberation for the oppressed, including your own liberation from your own, and I would argue, colonization. But I recognize how people also make arguments that no, um, that's not the call of the Christian. I, I would say they're not good arguments ultimately, but certainly they claim, and some of them know the Bible very well, they just can't see the forest from the trees from my vantage point. Interesting. I like that phrase, can't see the forest from the trees. Yeah. Um, so that being said, what is it about your beliefs and the messages that you try to get across through your podcast and, and through the work that you do that makes you comfortable still saying evangelical as opposed to dropping that aspect yes do i have the book here uh, i think it's over there there's actually okay so let's talk about, about that really quick first let's recognize the obvious the term evangelical is not a great term in america right now for really good reason like there's no excuses um it's not like people are are, are misrepresenting what what especially white evangelicals stand for i mean we know 80 percent of them voted for trump in 2016 and in 2020 i mean we, we have the data okay however the term evangelical is is malleable it did not always mean what it means today there's right. a really good book um by an author named donald dayton called um or rediscovering or i'm sorry discovering an evangelical heritage and he kind of makes the point that early american evangelicals through what's known as the wesleyan tradition were actually quite socially minded they were the some of the first abolitionists in america they were the first um christians to ordain women in america there's even a story of a woman who got married and said i'm not taking my husband's name i'm not gonna be treated as property i am my own person it's like yeah that's badass and they were incredibly pious. They were incredibly devoted to their way of life, devoted to Jesus and love of neighbor. So there definitely is, I think, a history to at least attempt to reclaim. I'm not gonna, I, I don't have enough guts to make it seem like what we're doing is, you know, in history gonna, you know, shift the tides, but we're right. at least swinging the bat as hard as we can to try and say, listen, if the word evangelical simply means someone who brings good news, I think it's safe to say that evangelicals today do not have good news to bring. Their, their news is really shitty. It's steeped in supremacy. It's steeped in far-right nationalism. It is focused on maintaining their own power 
at the expense of others. So that's not good news. So can we try and bring some good news to people right. as evangelicals? That's kind of the whole idea. Interesting. And would you say, who do you get, if any, who do you get the most pushback from? Evangelical people or non-religious atheist people? Who do you think? I think I know, but some people <laughs> listening may not know. I mean, it's definitely evangelicals. You know, in fact, I would argue I almost sometimes feel more at home uh, with some of my, my 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 friends who are atheists in nature, you know, I've been on podcasts that are run by atheists, and they're just they're wonderful people. Now, obviously, any group has fundamentalists that they have to work through. Yeah, I've, of I've met those yeah. people for sure, but like, yeah, I mean, evangelicals in general that I've experienced do not, especially the, what I call gatekeepers, like some of the leaders, pastors, they're not a fan of our work. Uh, but that's okay because our work isn't designed for them, you know, it just isn't. Yeah. And so when somebody has an issue like that with your work, what is it that they typically, is there any like one particular thing that you say or that you, um, that you, what's the word I'm looking for, um, that you promote that they have like the biggest issue with, I mean, or is it just kind of all over? I mean, there's a few big ones. I, I think queer inclusion is one for sure. You know, the fact yeah. that, that, that we are affirming, um, you know, that's one of the biggest ones. Um, I think how we view the Bible uh, is one of them, which again is kind of ironic because, you know, there's a lot of great theologians who are committed Christians who who we draw from. We're not drawing from like you know, n it's not like we're drawing from an atheist or something. Hold on one sec. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, you know, so so, but you have to understand that like you know, evangelicalism in America is so narrow, but it thinks it has like this true gospel or the only way of being Christian. It can't. It can't reconcile that there are other Christians way outside of its own boundaries that are committed to Jesus and might even view the things like the Bible differently than they do. Um, and so that that would be probably one of the biggest ones. Interesting. And yeah. do you find that most of the pushback comes from older individuals, people your age, people who think you like, I don't know what millennials, Gen are you are you Gen X? Yeah, I'm Gen 34. So I'm, Gen I'm millennial. I'm like right in the middle of the pack. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's hard to know. I mean, you know, everyone's behind uh, an Instagram account. So I don't know that like the average range. I yeah. would say they're probably somewhere in my ballpark, you know, a couple of years yeah. below or above. Interesting. And then has there ever been a criticism that you've gotten from somebody like that that's given you pause and made you be like, maybe they are right? Like maybe, maybe their critique is genuine? Or have you always pretty much been pretty confident in what, what you think? Well, if if it comes if you're talking about like you know queer inclusion no like that that no. that ship has sailed but if it's come down to like maybe tone of voice or like hey like you just come across angry those things i, I always take into account because i'm very pragmatic so if if they're not hearing me because right. i'm too harsh for them now that's not our main audience but if i can tweak a few things that still cater to our community while also still giving people like that maybe pause to listen that's a yeah. win in my book right so i'm always willing to acknowledge that whenever we need to but as far as some of those core beliefs of you know um mainly around like you know social justice and just how we advocate for liberation those things are not i'm not persuaded by their perspectives because frankly i grew up in that perspective so i know right. it very well i believed it for most of my life it's just not a convincing argument for me has there ever been somebody surprising that you've lost touch with over your beliefs or have they all been pretty much expected I mean, losing my church community was not expected, you know, it was yeah. painful to, to lose just like that whole world of people because I was there for so long. Um, I mean, there were some other friends like throughout my life that I was close to who just kind of, I heard, I heard, th th you know, I heard it through the grapevine. They're not really interested in being a friend anymore because I'm, I'm too far gone. But as I've gotten, as I've been doing this work longer and longer, I wouldn't say I've gotten callous to it. I'm just, it's just kind of expected. And I just, I understand, you know, like they're yeah. very committed to what they think is this fidelity to this Christian tradition. And certainly I think it's really problematic, but it is what it is. And you know, I, I can't convince right. them. Right. I, I spoke to somebody the other night about belief and how it's, I don't ever get upset with somebody who believes differently than me or like takes issue with my beliefs because I recognize that they believe that they are correct just as much as I believe that I am correct. And it's just as genuine to them as it is to me. So when they think they are doing the right thing by trying to tell me, you know, what you're doing is wrong, what you're saying is not biblical, that it's a sin, yada, yada, to them, they are being just as honest as I am when I'm 
saying what it is that they disagree with, I guess. Yeah, I think what frustrates me from personally is that I'm willing to make room for them, but it seems like a lot of times they can't make room for me. Exactly. You know? uh, and that is frustrating to me. Like, but again, like that's that's how fundamentalism behaves, right? It's like it is naturally incredibly exclusive. And so exactly. it's kind of par for the course. Right. And I agree a hundred percent there. It's like, if we can both agree that we disagree, but I can accept you and you can't accept me. That's I think where the the problem lies, right? Like I'm, I'm never going to be angry with those people, but it is odd to me that they can't exercise the exact same welcomeness and the exact same understanding to me as I can to them and like putting our differences aside, I guess. Yeah, exactly. And then there's the whole, some differences don't deserve to be put aside, right? Like I don't want to be friends with anybody who's like anti-gay, you know, who's who thinks that black lives matter less than white lives. Like that's all somebody I want to stay in touch with anyway. So yeah, you know, I lost. struggle with that sometimes because like, what do you do when like, that's your parents, right? Like, what do you do when that's like your family or that's right. Like, or, or, or that, that is a friend who, who will hold space for you. Right. And yep. maybe it maybe doesn't see queer inclusion the same way. I'm not saying I have an answer to that, but I struggle with like that humanity piece. Right. Because I know I, I was changed because people held space for me. Like I didn't right. grow up, you know, I grew up fundamentalist, right? So how did I go from that to being who I am now? Because my friends who were gay, like told me their stories, even when I wasn't fully affirming on like a biblical level, right? Yes. And that like changed me. So I, I, I'm just saying I wrestle with that and like what right. you do with that. I don't always do it the best, I'm sure in, on, on either end of that spectrum, but I do, I am convinced that more than data or like getting that one up on someone on social media, stories change people. Um, yes. And that's how you get them to start thinking about things differently. Absolutely. And I'm right there with you. I remember having beliefs or even just thinking certain things were funny that like, luckily people had the patience with me to say like, why do you think that's funny? Like, maybe we don't think that's funny anymore. Like, maybe that wasn't so nice. Maybe that wasn't the way you should have treated that person. And like you said, only because people had that patience with me, was I able to change as a person? You know, was I able to like, look back and say like, oh, I've got, I've got a lot of reflecting to do and I've got a lot of changing to do and I'm grateful for those people. And then it's at, at the same time though, were any of those beliefs ever necessarily harmful to another human being like did i ever vote against the rights of another person no just because i made a joke about something so it's difficult to know like where you're going to draw the line yeah and i i think for me what's important is that we're always prioritizing the people that that, that we're trying to do this work from there right i'll give you i can give you an example of this actually um okay. so um so in december of last year so a couple months ago I got invited by someone to attend America Fest, which is a Christian nationalist extravaganza, 11,000 people, 80 speakers. Matt Walsh speaks there. Candace Owens speaks there. Trump Jr. Oh speaks there. It's hosted by uh, Turning Point USA, which is Charlie Kirk's thing. And I critique a lot of those guys. And someone who was going to speak at the event who likes some of the work that we do uh, said, hey, well, you know, I'll fly you out. I'll pay for your hotel. You should come out and just experience the event. And so I was like, uh, in my head, I'm like, uh, I absolutely would love to because I critique this stuff and I really yeah. want to, One thing you can't get online is the culture of something, right? Exactly. So, so being there for four days in, in the belly of the beast, so to speak, is like awesome. But before I did that, I pulled our community, right? And I, and I asked them, okay, what do you think? Should I go to this? Because ultimately, if they said no, for whatever reason, I would have to do my best to right. be okay with that, right? Because right. the community is who we're, we're primarily serving here. Now, I right. mean, 85% of them polled were like, yeah, you need to absolutely go. Yeah, and the rest, please do. And the other like, other 15% were like, we're worried about your safety. I'm like, I'm fine. I'm a big guy. It's no big deal. But that's an example of like, okay, I'm in this space. I met people. I got coffee with them. I shook their hands. They gave me their cell phone numbers. Christian nationalists, people I can right. take online. And, but I'll also, they know where my allegiance lies, right? right. There's so no think, trick there. Exactly. There's no trick there. So I think exactly. that's like one example of that. I'm going to grab a stool really quick because the sun is like eating me alive. What you got to do? My uh, blinds are broken. Hold on one second. <laughs> no problem. Uh, where are you located currently? I am right outside of Philadelphia in New Jersey. I'm like 10 minutes from Philly. There we go. Okay. I think this will do. If I fall halfway through, just keep going. Just pretend we'll like do. you didn't see anything. Yeah, no, we'll, we'll do. <laughs> Perfect. Um, let's see. That's just going to have to stay that way. Perfect. Um, so 
There we go. Do you feel like the podcast and the work that you've done since starting the brand has changed you even more as a person? Or do you still feel pretty similar to the way that you felt when you started it? No, I mean, I'm a very different person as far as beliefs and just orientation to to the world. Yeah. Uh, you know, when you hear thousands of stories from people who have been marginalized by the evangelical church, have had their, their voices silenced, and then you see examples of that by like major leaders in those spaces, harming people and getting away with it with no repentance or accountability, that changes you. And when you start having a podcast, as you know, and you're talking to amazing guests who are brilliant, yes. Uh, you're like, oh, I didn't realize that. I didn't realize this. I didn't understand this. So, so even my understanding of of terms like supremacy or white supremacy or or the evangelical history of being b- built on supremacy, that's all like that all happened to me while I'm doing this work. Like, right, oh, right. Shit. Like this is way worse than I thought. Yes. And of course, you know the Christian nationalists. I mean, I mean, I'll I was our account was like four weeks old when when January sixth happened. And I'm like, what the fuck? What? Yeah. Like, what is, and what are these Christian flags doing here? And, and this prayer to Jesus. And again, it was one of those moments where I'm like, okay, certainly the evangelical machine will be like, oh my God, what have we done? We have to rethink this. W- what led to this? But no, right? It's just excuse, excuse, excuse. So I think all of that in, the, in reading books and you're trying to understand this work, it has totally shifted who I am as a person, theologically, morally, ethically, sociologically, completely. Has it impacted how you are a spouse or a parent? (sighs) Yeah, that's a great question. My spouse and I are very different. Uh, My spouse is more agnostic, mystic type. um, And she, quote unquote, deconstructed before I did. Um, I, I, it's hard to say. I've always been, my wife and I have always had a really healthy marriage. Uh, mm-hmm. even though, uh, in our wedding pictures, we did a foot washing ceremony that no one will ever see pictures of, but you know, we were good <laughs> evangelicals. Right. Um, it definitely, I think it's only strengthened our marriage. It's only helped us make room for each other. Um, I think that how I parent, I mean, see, here's the thing is I have a two and a half year old and eight month old. So I don't really know oh, myself wow. as a parent before a lot of this work, you know, you're I mean? like, I'm still trying to figure out who I am as a parent before Jeez, if I've changed Louise, as parent. Seriously. That's oh my God. Funny. Parenting is wild. So yeah, so I I don't know if it's made me a better parent, but it definitely influences how my wife and I parent together. Yeah, and have you ever heard an argument from the side of atheists or like a point, even not like an argument, that you're like, that's a good point or that's a great question regarding like like the existence of God, the existence of God, why they are no longer involved in the church, like the any of the benefits they talk about, maybe being an atheist, just anything at all that's kind of given you pause before. Oh yeah, I mean, I listen, I think that I think that in a lot of ways, you know, um belief in God or belief that Jesus rose again from the dead in particular, that's a pretty aud- audacious claim. Like I recognize yeah. how many people atheists or not are like, yeah, dude, like, you know, how do you even prove that happened? I'm like, yeah, no, I totally get it, you know. Yeah. So I I think that like there's a lot of fair points that are made. Um, and I, yeah, for sure, regarding the church and how they were, and how people who, uh, who maybe were Christian are now atheists, how they were treated, it, it tracks like with me completely yeah. personally for the way I'm wired. I, I just am not wired and it could be because of how I was brought up, but like the yeah. God thing is very, is, it, for me, it's a very helpful belief of making sense of certain aspects of life in the universe. So mm-hmm. I hold to it. Uh, but I, I understand why atheists would not, you know, or why they yeah. would even argue like how problematic religion can be at times. I mean, I think it's a very fair point. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I've definitely heard arguments on both sides of the coin. Like I, some of the best people I know in my entire life are devout Christians. And when they talk about the reasons why they're Christians, the reasons why they remain religious, it's like, I, I get it. I totally understand why that would be believable and attractive. And then at the same time, like from the perspective of atheists, when they talk about how they became an atheist, why they deconstructed, that makes sense too. So it's like just getting them to sit down and kind of have that conversation and explain why it is they believe what they believe and and what it would take for them to change their mind, I think is very helpful in terms of trying to just like start that conversation and and get people on both sides of, of the coin to kind of understand where they're coming from. I think a lot of us actually have a lot more in common than we think. I think a lot of the same pain that we've gotten from the church applies to 
Christians and atheists. I think a lot of the same joy that we find within the church applies to Christians and at one point maybe applied to atheists or atheists understand like how Christians feel that joy and they find that joy somewhere else or the joy that we seek. Maybe we haven't found it yet on either side of the coin. Um, yeah. I mean, I feel like, I feel like what's interesting is that a lot of people in my spaces and a lot of people in the atheist community share a lot of the same values, right? So right. we have very, we have radically different beliefs about like yes. God and, you know, the Bible, but we share a, a, a similar values about, you know, equality and like treating people yes. well and like fighting for marginalized groups and also recognizing how we can be part of that problem sometimes, yes. right? So, so I think that, that that's what's so interesting is that a lot of evangelicals who find our work helpful realize that like, just because you share the same beliefs doesn't mean you automatically share the same values, even though you kind of right. assume it, right? Oh, well, if we believe the same thing about the Bible and God, we must share the same value of like this thing. When in reality, mm -hmm. a lot of us found out like, actually, I don't share many of the same values that these folks share. Right. And because of that, I'm now called a heretic and kicked out that what, like, how does that work? Right. So I right. think that, that could be part of it. Yeah. I think values, morals, and beliefs are three totally different things. Yeah. And a lot of people think that you have to have, like, say, for example, I I've heard a lot of people say that you have to be a Christian in order to have morality. And I don't think that's the case. Um, right that's like a huge thing. I didn't know how many people argue that until I started reading into it, that like oh, morals wouldn't exist God. without God. Right. Yeah, and yeah. so, um, what is one of your favorite, or is there a moment that's one of your favorite of somebody saying or commenting or telling you about how your organization changed them? Yeah. I mean, you know, we, we get a decent amount of people who, who tell us things like that, that are just really moving and mind blowing. Um, you know, just, people who were like, Hey, I just had nowhere to go. I found your account. And like, it was just, it was life-saving or it just helped me so much. And like, that just makes this work worth it. You know what I mean? Um, it's not always easy work. It can be tough. There are days where I'm sure like you, you have kind of that like creative block, right? Of like, what do I do? What do I talk about? Right. How do, how do I make content today? Then you make content into bombs. Like, oh my God, I'm a pathetic loser. What am I doing wrong? So you, like, there's, there's that whole world. And then someone DMs you like, I just want you to know, like this account has just like, just changed the game. And you're like, okay, like that, this is why we do the work, right? Like more than yes. likes or views or whatever, whatever the fuck people think is notoriety in America on Instagram or social media. That's all bullshit because what really matters is that are you helping people? Are you are you helping them be better versions of themselves? Exactly. And, and in our case, are you helping people explore the Christian tradition beyond that basement? And whenever we get someone who says that we are, it is just really encouraging. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, one of my favorite things is the number of messages I get from people who tell me they can't publicly follow my podcast, but they listen to it all the time, but they can't like subscribe to it. They can't be seen liking it. They can't have it on their YouTube, but they've listened to every episode. That's like, well, it's my favorite thing, but it's also sad. But like, yeah. those are my favorite messages to get is that it's reaching people like that. Yes. Um, because if they're seen with something that has like the word atheist or agnostic or whatever trouble, right. But totally. they're still reaching out for different opinions. They're not just taking what they're being fed by those around them as the, the word, right. As like the way to live. 100%. Um, so do you think that over the course of leading these podcasts and, and this content that you might evolve to a point where maybe you don't identify with the word evangelical anymore, or does that seem, yeah. would I you mean, ever like rebrand? Never say never. Right. I mean, I've, I've learned that in my life already. <laughs> yeah. So is there always a chance? Like, of course there is, you know, yeah. um, at this point, the 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 name makes sense for us. It, it is helpful. It, it serves a purpose. Um, could that change? Yeah, for sure. Um, but at this point, that's not like something I've I've given a lot of thought to, or, or like right. that I'm even tempted to do. Right. Um, and and I think because I have always been one of those like more rebellious types, like more punk rock, more you know underdog kind of vibe. Keeping the name evangelical is kind of like my middle finger to the whole yeah. establishment. Like, yeah. you can't have the term. We're gonna take it, and we're gonna talk about about liberation theology and just deal with it. You know, yeah. so there's like there, there's also that side of it as well. I think a little bit that that keeps me wanting to keep that name. And if you sure. don't like it, unsubscribe or don't. Please come back. Actually, I need <laughs> right, to listen. Right, please come back. I beg you. <laughs> just pretend like it doesn't have a title, and you just like the picture. That's fine. <laughs> um, exactly. Well, that's really interesting. Do you? 
do you think that any of the um, like media that you do or do not consume, like the music that you listen to or the movies that you watch are impacted by your relationship like with the church or do you watch and listen to pretty much whatever you want? I, I mean, at this point, well, you know, it's interesting because I am thinking about what I consume, but from a different, very different perspective like reason so like for example right I, i'll give you an example of this so when i was in my more fundamentalist days there was a question of like should you should you play hillsong music in your church right and so the fundamentalists yeah. would be like no because it's not biblical because it's not theologically sound because hillsong is apostate and now on the other side i'm like well i don't i wouldn't not play hillsong music in my church because of that I would not play Hillsong Church in my um, Hillsong music in my church because Brian Houston, the founder of Hillsong, admitted to hiding his father's sex crimes. And also, yeah. Hillsong is an empire, and I think empire is inherently antichrist in nature, right? Yeah. So it, it is funny how like you you can get to the same like solution from very different perspectives. Yeah. Um, so I am thinking about that kind of in my own life, even with like quote unquote secular content. Like, okay, how is this made? Who is it prioritizing? Who is benefiting? Is it part of this capitalistic society that I'm trying to rethink? Obviously, we live in this world. We live in America. You can only do so much of that and still survive and take care of your kids and pay a mortgage, you know? Yeah. So I understand all that. But I, I am starting to maybe just have those questions, but from totally different perspectives that I would have had maybe like 10 years ago. Yeah, yeah. No, totally. I completely understand that whole two people or one person at two different points in their life coming to the same answer for totally different reasons. But Hey, it's the same answer. It's like when they make you show your work in math, you're like, did I get the answer right? Or did I not? (laughs) That's what matters. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. Um, do you, uh, oh man, I had a really good question for you and I totally just lost it. Um, oh shoot. I just had it. Hold on. Let me see if I can remember. Yeah. Um, let me think of a different one actually. Okay. Dang, I this has never questions. happened to me before. This is why. No, come on. Never about podcasts? Literally never. Literally never. That's um, I'm going to blame that I had COVID like a month ago. Um, no problem. We'll, yeah, we'll blame COVID. We'll blame COVID. Uh, do you see yourself in the future taking this like brand that you've made and taking it even further? Like, Do you see maybe like production companies and film as part of your umbrella, I suppose? Or yeah. are you more just keeping it towards? Well... We, we do, we are working on a mini docu-series um, uh, that will highlight stories from people, from, from folks in our community. So we're shooting like these like six to 10 minute like episodes. We just had our first one in New York City. That's really um, cool. Yeah, it was really cool. Um, you know, it's one of the problems I have uh, just because of how I'm wired is I, I have a lot of ideas that are kind of wide and I, I struggle with like focusing on like one or two things because I just see like, like all the potential for things. I don't have like grand plans of like oh we're gonna become the next like you know um big production house but i do think that like video content in all its forms including youtube instagram docuseries is kind of the future even like news but we're a long ways off from that right now we're a nonprofit. Yeah. you know people donate that's the reason that's the only reason we're able to do this work at the level that we do but you would need like some serious money to do that stuff yes the right way right like you, you could do right. it rinky dink but if you want to do it professionally and do it like in a way that is gripping for people, you have to have the money behind it. Right. And once you get that big money coming in, that's when you have to be careful not to like full circle back, you know, go all the way back to where you tried to. That's start. right. Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, it, you know, just because people deconstruct doesn't mean that you can't rebuild toxic evangelical systems again. Right. Totally. Uh, totally. So I a thousand percent agree. It's like. Yeah, I mean, and you know, I, there, there's a board, there, there's accountability here, which is great. But like, I worry about that sometimes. Like, okay, if we got that million dollar check, which would just be ridiculous, like, what does that make us? Are we like a mega church now? Like, that's what, what I what was thinking too. Money? You know, how does this? I don't know. I don't have answers for you yet. But if I ever get there, I'll give you a call and let you know. <laughs> perfect, perfect. If you ever open a mega church, let me know. I'll be there. Yeah, we'll day. Yeah. yeah, perfect. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I, I totally remember what the question was. I was going to ask you a minute ago. Hey. Are there any topics that you won't cover on your podcast just for the sake of maintaining listeners or just not going there? No. No. I've had Russell Moore on our podcast, who's a conservative Christianity Today writer. Yeah. I talked to him on our podcast. We do episodes with folks that we don't agree with. I've had a guy named Samuel Duth on our podcast, who is a lead pastor out of Awakened Church, who is a major Christian nationalist. 
someone who tells you, you know, don't get vaccinated. I've, I've had him on the podcast. And then we've had people like Joe Lumen on the podcast, who is, you know, very much liberation centered uh, and, and so on and so forth. So, no, we have a pretty wide array. Actually, I take it back. There was one person. I never told anyone this before publicly. I'll tell you. It makes okay. me clickbait. So yeah. in the beginning of the podcast, I was like, okay, I'll interview anyone who wants to come on. I ended up through a series of connections, getting in touch with someone who was a legitimate white supremacist, legitimately. Oh. Okay. They would not go on camera. They oh. used an alias. They, their email address ended in at proton mail, which is a very much like a white nationalist thing. Yeah. And this interview, when I was done with it, I was sick to my stomach. I, I was nauseous. And I talked to a few friends, I consulted them. I said, you know, there are people in our community from the BIPOC space who are queer. This would just be, I think, there's nothing beneficial of having someone on the podcast deny the, deny the Holocaust on the right. podcast. That, right. that, that's, that's where we were at. This person yes. denied the Holocaust. Yes. And I'm just like, you know, there's, we know these people exist, there's no benefit. That was the yeah. only time out of 128 episodes, 30 episodes, I've never not aired an episode. Okay. And that's, I'm so glad you said that because I have a question for you now. I have one episode like that where it's still in the recesses. It's the only one that hasn't been edited and posted yet. Luckily it's legitimately, there's a sound issue on their end. Like there was a true like sound issue that that's like one of the reasons why it didn't get edited. But I remember when I finished the interview, I, I literally called my brother and I was like, at what point does it go from being an educational conversation to giving somebody a platform who should not have a platform? Like yes. at what point is, is it I'm, oh, like my podcast is all about talking to people with different um, points of view, but at what point is a point of view harmful? And are you giving somebody airtime that maybe should not have airtime, no matter how clear you make it that you don't agree with this person? It, can it still be harmful? Can one person, even just one, listen to that podcast and be like, I actually think that person sounds pretty smart. I'm going to like Google them and follow them. Yeah. So what are your thoughts on that? Like, is that, yes. is it, what is white supremacy? Like the only one where you're like, I'm just not going to touch that or. Well, I mean, it's not that I won't touch it. I mean, I've, I've had people on who are drawing from that. Right. Like, but yeah. this person was like, so blatantly. Yes. Like, yes these other people are inferior yes we need to conquer we conquered america from the people who were here before us although he used a much more derogatory term right yeah that's what i'm like okay there's what's the benefit to this conversation right right like there's right. nothing there's nothing good faith happening here this person is espousing blatant propaganda about the holocaust and you're right if there's one person who goes oh this guy might be kind of smart. Am I doing more harm than good? So yes. yeah, I mean, I definitely listen. I think everyone has different, maybe levels of what, the, of what of what they might see as appropriate for their audience. But yes. I just knew for our audience, and also for me, like I, I'm not a person who thinks like that. God speaks to me anymore the same way that I used to. But that was right. such a gut, like oh my god, it just feels off. It doesn't feel right. There's intuition there. Call it whatever you want. Yes. The Holy Spirit, God, your intuition. But something was like this is not going to be a good idea if you air this publicly right uh, so i i totally feel that a thousand percent and then did they ever did they ever reach out or like hey yeah my well, episode. well when before we recorded we both agreed that we both have to sign off on the episode being released for it to be released got it and and he had a copy of the recording and i said hey i'm not comfortable doing this he kind of pushed back like why aren't you and i said i'm just not i don't owe you an explanation and i just pretty much said i'm just not comfortable releasing it and, and to this day as far as i know it never got released on his end or on my end um but yeah it was just a moment where i'm like you know this is i just don't want to be here this is this is too far into a world that that is like it's you know it's almost like dark web adjacent stuff yes. you know like that's yes. what we're talking about here Exactly. And even if, even if people listen to it and they're just like, they're just like crime podcast interested in it, you know, they're not, they're not even like, oh, I actually believe this guy. I think this guy, they just want to check out the platforms. Even that's too much for me. Even that's like, I don't want to lead anybody to these websites, even if it's just to make fun, you know, even if it's just to totally. quote unquote, you know, check it out and see, it's just, it's just too much. Yeah. So I'm glad I'm not the only one who's had that experience. Although mine was not white supremacy, but I just remember being like, like shook, just sitting there thinking, 
how do you respond to this? And, you know, my whole thing is I, you know, I like to give people a platform. I like to give them like the opportunity to speak their mind. I don't sure. like to debate. I, I do ask right. questions, but I'm not a debate person. Um, I was in a former life, but not anymore. And oh. there are just sometimes where you meet people where you're like, I can't be nice about what you're saying. No, <laughs> like right, I literally, exactly. I literally exactly. just can't be nice. Yeah. I, I, you're speaking my language. I'm very yeah. much the same way on the podcast. Like I'll ask a lot of questions. I'm, I'm curious, right? You're naturally yeah. a curious person. That's what makes you a good podcast host. And, but this person, I, at the end, when he denied the Holocaust and laughed about it, I knew yeah. I'm like, that's it. I am yep. so far fucking gone. This episode can never come out. Yep. Yep. Exactly. Exactly. I did not ask this man if he thought the Holocaust had happened. And I'm glad that I didn't because I don't know what his answer would have been. But, uh, yeah, that's wild. That's wild. And so has that at all, has that experience at all impacted how you find your guests or is it just kind of a water under the bridge? You know, it's tough because our podcast is at the point where people are are soliciting us pretty often. Like, Hey, can I come on your show? And I, I always appreciate that. And in the beginning I was like, yeah, I'll take anyone. But now that we have like a rhythm, we're a little more established. It's like, Hmm, I can't just take you from like random Instagram and talk about right. this one thing that you might have written in some ebook like one time, you know? Right. Uh, and, and and listen, that's not a slight on those people. No, Everyone has no. to start from somewhere. Yeah. But um, I would say like at this point, most of the people that we talk to are either like they're somewhat established in the worlds that right. we exist in, whether it's a scholar of Christian nationalism like Bradley Odishi, or it's someone like Joe Lumen, who's a personal friend, but also does a lot of work in that space. So right. we're always trying to get those like those guests who are a little more well known to kind of pick pick their brains. Exactly. Yeah. And not only pick their brains, but also I think there comes a point where because I like to have the average layman on the show, but also there comes a point where you're like, this person's platform can help get the message across as well. So it's like it's not that you care less about other people's story than others, but this person one, they they know how to interview on a podcast. They know what yep. that entails. They know, right. you know, they're they're not trying to keep anything from anybody. They put everything out there. And then also, can I reach more people with this message by interviewing this person, you know, potentially than yeah. by interviewing somebody who may not even put it on anything because nobody knows they're on it. No, that's exactly right. I mean, you know, for us, people want to talk about like theology. They, they want to be a, they want to be introduced to, to different rooms in the Christian tradition. So we try and find guests who are, you know, process theologians or talking about hell in different ways. And that helps our community kind of think about things differently. So that's definitely the focus. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, well, I've had a wonderful time talking to you. I know that I said I would only keep you for an hour. So we're coming, we're coming to the bottom of the hour. But Tim, if we wanted to find your content, your podcast, anything else that it is that you produce or that you have coming out, where could we go to find those? Uh, yeah, anything that has the new evangelicals on any of our platforms is pretty much us at this point. So whether it's podcasts or Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, Facebook, you know, et cetera, that's that that's where you can find all of our work. We have a website, thenewevangelicals.com. Um, we're pretty active on, on all those different platforms. We have a YouTube channel. It's not updated super frequently. We're working on that. Uh, and of course, we have a podcast, the New Evangelicals podcast as well. Awesome. And I will link all of those in the show notes if that's cool with you. So they can just click on it yeah. directly and find you. Um, but that was all the questions I had for you. And I really appreciate talking to you. And I appreciate the work that you do. I appreciate the the candor that you have. Because, you know, I I don't know if we even talked about this. I'm an atheist. Um, but what? I, Cancel the whole thing. I can't yeah, yeah, on this oh, show. <laughs> no, this heretic. I, I realized like halfway through, I was like, I don't even know if I told him. I but, will be praying for you, Sydney. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. I felt, I literally felt a little, like, like a little bubble wrap, wrap oh, pop in my soul for like it another worked. prayer. Yeah. Um, I'll go back and just like whip myself with like a cat of nine tails. <laughs> Please don't do that. <laughs> yeah. Um, but one thing I really, really like is um, when I find somebody like you who is one, very open and honest about their beliefs and their message to open with anybody. Like you seem like the kind of person where anybody could come up to you and ask you questions about what it is that you do or what it is that you believe. And you would treat them the same. You know, you mentioned earlier, sometimes you feel even more comfortable among atheist friends, you know, and I think that's so important because I think one of the things missing between um, religious people and non-religious people is conversation versus debate. And I think our generation is doing a really great job of having conversations as opposed to always making it a debate. Um, 
And so when your podcast popped up on my list, I was so excited because even though we have, you know, obvious theological differences, I think, as we mentioned earlier, a lot of our social, political, moral um, um, we talk about values, I think a lot of our values are probably the same. Um, so, yeah, I'm just grateful to you for everything you do. Well, thank you for you know having me on and talking with me about this stuff that, like you, I, I love to talk about. And I, I totally agree with like the debate thing. I mean, I, I maybe it's my own baggage, but like I've just found I, I have yet to see an atheist convinced by like uh, an apologetic, you know. And right. honestly, I'm kind of over trying to convince people to like my positions. Like, okay, we're talking about did you know God? I mean, welcome to the conversation. Um, and honestly, I, I'm with you. Like conversations are more important to me than like than trying to debate someone and like get them in this corner where like you just you own them you know you own right. the libs like it's just kind of useless to me there's bigger fish to fry you know yeah my favorite thing is when the exact same conversation like yours or mine can go on one platform and be like atheist owns lib and then the yeah. exact same conversation can yes. go on your channel and be like watch me own this atheist she's so scared yes. she didn't even tell me till the end like because she was too scared that's exactly right though is that a, I, i've seen those videos i'm like wait i watched the clip like you did not own this person at all you right. know but <laughs> yeah 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 my one of my favorite was i was at the gym and on one tv was fox news and on the other tv was cnn they were showing the exact same clip and on one channel it was this inflammatory like this is a claim that all the stuff is going to burn down and on the other it's like hey there might be a thing in a few months take a look and it's like the exact same clip the same yeah, just wild right. yeah but you just know half the country is getting like fired up about no, it and the other sure. half's like but um sure. well thank you again for your time i really appreciate it and i will send you this episode and all the links to the platforms it's on as soon as it goes live sounds good thanks for having me no problem i'll talk to you later see ya Bye.